Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Space This Week, my weekly Starship and Space News update, litho breaking to your screens every single Monday. And as usual, we have had a busy week. Lots of Starship news, including the 33 engine static fire test, rollout of a very unusual Starship prototype, two Falcon 9 launches, an exciting launch from India, big updates from both the Chinese and international space stations, new evidence of ancient water on Mars, progress updates for the exciting X-59 aircraft, a hot fire of the new upgraded SLS main engines, I was flown out to ESA headquarters in order to play a very exciting video game, can't wait to talk about that, and much, much more. Let's kick things off as usual with Starship updates. I'm going to cut right to the chase for you guys. On Thursday, we started ramping up for the fabled 33 engine static fire test of Super Heavy Booster 7. Here's the views from NASA Spaceflight Starbase live stream. You can view Starbase 24 7 on NASA Spaceflight streams. Check out the link in the description. Things were certainly very exciting. The rocket was filled extremely quickly. The blurriness of the frost line on the liquid oxygen tank shows how fast things were filled up. In fact, the oxygen tank was pretty much filled to the brim, while the methane tank was filled just a small amount. It's all speculation as to why this ratio was chosen, though the amount of liquid oxygen may well have been to add more weight to the booster to make it easier for the launch clamps to hold it down and prevent it from ticking off during the static fire. After fueling, we waited with bated breath. And then, there goes the FireX suppression system, which lasted for seemingly seven centuries. And then there it is, a massive static fire of the Raptor 2 engines. In the end, this static fire only consisted of 31 engines, as one Raptor was shut down just before the test, and one engine self-aborted as the test burn began, for reasons unclear at this stage. It's really hard to pick a favorite piece of footage of this event, but I think Cosmic Perspectives is definitely up there. Listen to that engine roar sound. Amazing stuff. But what's absolutely incredible is that this is not only just two engines short of the full thing, but the engines themselves were operating at only 50% throttle according to Elon. So what you're seeing here is under half of the full thrust of Booster 7. Nonetheless, this is still the single most powerful rocket stage ever fired in North America. Yes, the Saturn V has finally been dethroned, but we're still just shy of the massive 1610 kilonewtons of thrust produced by the N1L3 at liftoff. But with the Starship orbital flight test supposedly taking place next month, the N1's record definitely looks set to be beaten very soon. Make sure you subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss my coverage of the orbital flight test. And of course, if you are enjoying things so far then don't forget to hit like on this video as it really helps me out with the whole algorithm and stuff and I always do appreciate it. You guys are probably aware that myself and a few other space creators were in Amsterdam last week for a very special video game event which I'll talk about later on in this video and one evening we dined in a planetarium. Now we managed to get the staff there to put the NASA spaceflight live stream up on the ceiling to watch the moment those engines ignited. I was sharing a table with everyday astronaut EJSA, Scott Manley, Jatwa, Daz from NASA Spaceflight and a few others so you can imagine the atmosphere was pretty intense. Here's my perspective of that fateful moment. Is it counting down? Yeah. 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 Oh. 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 oh yes! Wow. What is it? Is that are those birds or birds? Look at the birds! Look at the birds! They're flying, it means they're not dead. <laughs> Obviously, we didn't get all the engines if they're not dead. Look at that! From across the channel? No, is that south? Look at the birds! It's a new kind of perforation. Wow. Freaking wildlife refuge. <laughs> go cameras too! Yeah. 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 Uh, they gotta repaint it again. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was a super fun experience, though I guess it was a shame that my camera didn't really pick up on faces too well. It was very dark in that room. <laughs> With all the excitement of Booster 7, it's easy to overlook its neighbor, Ship 25. But this vehicle is likely going to conduct a static fire of its own very soon. The crane that's been parked next to it for quite some time now has moved away from it last week in order to clear the area, hopefully, for a future static fire event. One thing I'm curious about is when, if ever, Ship 25 will get liveries painted on its side, like Ship 25 
4. I can't wait to see S25 proudly displayed on that nose cone. We were hoping to see some testing from Ship 25 last week, in fact, and things certainly seemed hopeful. On Monday, the site was cleared, and we even saw Apollo, one of SpaceX's Boston Dynamics built robot dogs, sniffing around the base of the vehicle, but we never ended up seeing any spin prime or static fire testing. As for other Starship vehicles, we saw the rollout of the very mysterious Ship 26 last week. On Sunday, the bare-bones Starship left the high bay and rolled down to the launch area. We're still not quite sure what this vehicle will be used for. One theory was that this is going to be an expendable Starship prototype that will allow SpaceX to begin launching Starlink V2 before they've perfected the reusable Starship upper stage. But now, we're really not sure. Ship 26 does have a number of changes to it over its predecessors though, explained in an excellent Twitter thread by the Ring Watchers. I highly recommend following the link in the description to check this thread out for yourselves, but to summarize just a few of their findings here, Ship 26 will feature internal stringers on its liquid oxygen tank, as opposed to external ones seen on previous ships. The liquid oxygen tank also has a new vent system. Those classic cowbell vents from previous ships have been replaced with a single large pressure vent, and the two vents used for roll control are unchanged. There's also speculation that Ship 26 may be the first starship to have electric thrust vector control, rather than hydraulic thrust vector control, which is an upgrade already implemented with Booster 9. This will be confirmed once we see the actuators on Ship 26's engines when they're moved to the high bay for install. I talked a lot last week about the water deluge system that SpaceX are installing at the orbital launch pad. Last week, work on this continued. We saw four large water tanks delivered to the launch site, as well as more manifold and pipe works for install, seen here thanks to Lab Padre. And by Wednesday, these tanks were assembled along with their associated piping. Our eye in the sky, Greg Scott performed a flyover at Starbase Kennedy last week. As you can see, the Star Factory building is nearly complete. The end of the building here comprises of two separate levels, but the render shared by Elon a while ago only appears to have one upper level. Well, hopefully now you can see why this is. This shielding structure here hides the two levels to make it look like it's just one. Not a huge amount of changes have happened since the last flyover though. We still have seven tower segments present for the location unknown third Starship launch tower, and curiously, the high base still hasn't begun construction. SpaceX still have their crane surrounded by all the parts, but nothing is being built yet. Perhaps SpaceX are waiting for some building or planning permissions to be finalized before construction can begin. The chopsticks and their carriage for the third launch tower have started being welded together over here, as you can see in this image. Over at launch site 39A, we can see that the chopsticks have now been attached to the second launch tower, where they now await install of the rest of the lifting apparatus. We can also see the mystery tank now is virtually complete. There's no official word on what this tank will be used for, liquid oxygen or water, but I have a strong feeling that this is going to be used for liquid oxygen storage. Here is Space Launch Complex 40. This is undergoing some fairly major work in order to allow it to support future crew and cargo dragon launches. Pad 39B is also having some works done. This is in support of Artemis 2, which is hopefully going to launch in 2024. While on the subject of Artemis, we can see repairs being carried out to the launch platform used for Artemis 1, and this area behind it is likely cleared in order to construct the launch platform required for the bigger SLS Block 1B for the Artemis 4 mission. Greg caught an occluded Delta IV Heavy at Launch Complex 37, which is being prepared for its mission that could be as early as next month, and it's definitely not to be missed, as this will be the second to last ever Delta IV Heavy mission. Last week's launch calendar began on Tuesday. Now, I already talked about this launch last week, so if you want to skip to the next launch, then head to this timecode. But anyway, yes, this was a Falcon 9 launch from the Kennedy Space Center at Launch Complex 40. The rocket carried just the one satellite, the Spanish communication satellite Amazonas Nexus. This was placed into geosynchronous Earth orbit, where, once operational, it'll replace the Amazonas 2. The satellite is operated by Hispasat, who operate a number of Spanish communication satellites, and they've stated that the Nexus will deliver high-capacity mobile services to the air and maritime transport sectors, among others, and this new satellite features a new generation digital transparent processor. The Nexus will have coverage over the whole of the American continent, the Atlantic corridors north and south, and Greenland. The other SpaceX launch that we saw last week was on Sunday, and this was another Starlink mission, Starlink 5-4. 
The Falcon 9 launched from the Cape Canaveral Space Force Base, carrying 55 Starlink satellites to low Earth orbit. Following stage separation, the Falcon 9 first stage successfully landed on the A Short Fall of Gravitas drone ship, which was stationed in the Atlantic Ocean around 660 kilometers downrange from the launch pad. This was Booster 1062's 12th overall mission, having previously supported the GPS SV-4 and SV-5 missions, Inspiration-4, Axiom-1, Nilesat-301 and six Starlink launches. On Friday, we had a launch out of India, which means I must once again get creative with the footage here if I want to avoid a copyright claim from the Indian government. <laughs> this was the second flight of the ISRO's SSLV-D2 rocket, which launched from the Satish Darwin Space Center's first launch pad. SSLV stands for Small Satellite Launch Vehicle, and on this mission, it carried the EOS-07 Earth Observation Satellite to low Earth orbit, as well as the Azadisat, a small 8kg CubeSat developed by Space Kids India. It was built by schoolgirls from 75 schools across India, with 10 girls from each school, as part of a mission to give girls from lower income backgrounds the opportunity to learn about the fundamentals of spaceflight. The other secondary payload for this flight was the Janus-1 American Technology Demonstration CubeSat, which will test advanced experimental laser and radio communications, as well as Internet of Things communications. Over on the International Space Station, the Progress MS-20 autonomously undocked from the Zvezda service module's rear port on Tuesday. The Progress spacecraft are the Russian cargo resupply vehicles, and this particular vehicle delivered around three tons of food, fuel, and supplies for the station's crew. Later on in the week, the latest Progress mission, MS-22, was launched. This took place on Thursday from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, once again atop a Soyuz 2.1A. Like its predecessor, the Progress MS-22 will deliver around three tons of food, fuel, and supplies for the Expedition 68 crew aboard the station. After a two-day journey, it autonomously docked to the aft port of the Zvezda service module on Saturday. Hopefully the supplies are now being enjoyed by the crew. Over at the other space station, the Chinese Tiangong station, the Shenzhou 15 astronauts completed their first spacewalk last week. According to Chinese state media, astronauts Jun Longfei and Liu Zhang performed an extensive seven-hour spacewalk from the Wentian Laboratory module on Thursday. This is the station's first large-scale extravehicular activity following the assembly of all three major modules of the Tiangong. This spacewalk was to facilitate the continued final stages of construction of the station, and the astronauts installed external pumps outside the Mengtian module, which will aid with the thermal control and function of the laboratory and its externally mounted scientific apparatus. Over the past two months, the Shenzhou 15 crew have unlocked, installed, and tested all experiment cabins on the Mentian laboratory module, starting experiments one after another. I talk a lot about the Perseverance rover on this channel because I guess that's the most recent robotic mission to the Red Planet. But Curiosity, which landed on Mars 10 years ago now, is still going strong, and last week NASA released this panorama taken by the rover. Curiosity is currently exploring Mount Sharp, a three-mile tall mountain. You can see its summit here. The rover is currently in the foothills along this ridge line known as the Marker Band, a dark and thin band of rock that's distinct from the layers above and below it, which scientists had previously seen in satellite photography. What exactly the Marker Band is was somewhat of a mystery. Upon exploration of the rover, it became clear that the rocks here are really hard. The rover initially struggled to drill into them. Looking closer at this part of the image here, you can see a ripple texture, which would have been created billions of years ago by waves in a shallow lake. Rovers have travelled through lake beds in the past, but we have never seen ripples this clearly before. This is not the only evidence of water in this panorama. Up ahead is an area called Getus Vallis, and this is where Curiosity is heading towards. You can see evidence of an ancient landslide here, washed down by wet ground. NASA scientists believe that this landslide debris is probably the most recent evidence of water that we will ever see, and their presence here means that Curiosity can study rock layers originating from high up on Mount Sharp that it otherwise wouldn't be able to reach as they are too high up the mountain. Now I do love me a good experimental aircraft. The X-15 is probably my favourite, but others, like the mysterious X-37, are also really cool as well. And NASA is hard at work on the latest in the X-Plane series, the X-59. The X-59 is being developed by Lockheed Martin at Skunk Works for NASA's Low Boom project. One of the major hurdles to supersonic flight over land is the sonic boom. Concord had a sonic boom so loud that many countries banned it from flying supersonic over their airspaces. Here's a clip of that. 
Now that's not ideal for flying over housing, but the X-59 is aiming to create a sonic boom only about one one thousandth as loud as current supersonic aircraft, about as loud as a closing car door. It will achieve this by using a long and narrow airframe and canard, among other special design choices. Here is a time lapse of the X-59 under construction while at Lockheed Martin Fort Worth in Texas. The aircraft was in Texas for structural and fuel testing and then returned to the Lockheed Martin facility in Palmdale, California to complete assembly. This time lapse was recorded after the aircraft was returned to the Lockheed Martin Skunk Works in Palmdale, captured between April and June of last year. The aircraft is now in its final stages of assembly, and NASA hopes for the X-59 to have its maiden flight at some point this year. With all eyes on the Starship 31 engine static fire, you may have missed the latest NASA SLS RS-25 engine static fire on Wednesday. This was a test of a newly redesigned RS-25 engine variant, which will be used for future flights of the SLS rocket. Last week's test was its first hot fire test, which took place at the Fred Hayes test stand at the Stennis Space Center in Mississippi. The test lasted for 500 seconds, or about eight and a half minutes, the length of time that the engine will need to fire during an actual flight. The new engine features a number of upgraded components over its predecessors, including a new nozzle. This new RS-25 engine design will enter service with the Artemis V mission. As for Artemis missions that are going to happen a little bit sooner, Artemis II's crew module test article was put to use earlier this month at the Turn Basin in the Launch Complex 39 area at the Kennedy Space Center. This isn't a real Orion capsule, hence the name test article, but for all intents and purposes, it's identical to the real thing for these exercises. It's used to practice the recovery after splashdown of Orion to help prepare the support and recovery crews ahead of the real Artemis II crewed mission. Okay, I'm guessing you guys are all really, really excited for Kerbal Space Program 2, right? Well, last week I hopped on a train, and then a bus, and then a plane, heading out to the European Space Agency's STEC facility in the Netherlands. There, I and a few other space creators you may recognize got to go to the Erasmus Center and checked out some cool things like the life-size Columbus demonstration module, a model of the Rosalind Franklin rover, and more. And I also got to play a very special video game there. Now, I'm not really supposed to share gameplay footage of this with you yet, but what the heck, here's an exclusive video just for viewers of Space This Week. I played multiplayer with Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut, at Dance Dance Revolution! Yes, it was a battle of the ages, guys. Fueled by Heineken, but in the end, sadly, Tim just beat me. Now, I blame this on the fact that I was wearing my Kraken Slayer hoodie, available for purchase from this video's description, by the way, as it simply provided too much insulation and I got overly hot. It is just too good as a hoodie for its own good. Anyway, yes, Dance Dance Revolution. What an amazing game and an experience. Thank you all who flew me out and made it all happen. I also got to play KSP2, I guess. <laughs> I would show you some footage of this, but what do you know? Oh no, I'm out of time! I guess I'll have to show you my gameplay of this on a later date, eh? Wink wink. Make sure you're subscribed with the notifications turned on so that you get notified of when this happens. And hey, if you want to support my channel even further, then you can join my membership program or my Patreon, just like the lovely folk on the left did, to get some exclusive videos and early access to content. Check out the links in the description or the Patreon card on screen. And hey, there should be two other videos on there as well that YouTube thinks you'll like. Hopefully they're good picks. But yes, thank you all so much for watching this episode of Space This Week. It was a long one, wasn't it? But we all made it through together. Uh, yes, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.